this year's Calgary International Chess Festival, uh, which is of course uh, this lecture. Uh, so before I go on with that, I just wanted to make sure everybody knows about the other events that are coming up. So tomorrow we have the big event starting uh, in the evening uh, at 7 o'clock. We will, everybody is welcome to come regardless of whether you're participating or not. We'll also do some games online. And uh, Monday, August, uh, fir uh, yeah, August 1st, we will have a blitz tournament starting at 5 o'clock, registration 4.30. Everybody is welcome to come and participate. And then uh, from Tuesday to Friday, we'll have a chess camp for kids. So if you have kids or if you are a kid between the ages of 6 and 16, uh, you are, uh, you're welcome to join that. So now uh, I'd like to introduce our special guest. He is uh, possibly one of the best, if not the best, chess player to ever come to Calgary, and uh, he's got many, many accomplishments, uh, among them uh, five-time United States champion and uh, former world championship finalist. Uh, he played uh, for the world championship in the 1990s against Anatoly Karpov. He's a uh, FIDE World Cup winner also, and currently residing in the United States, Grandmaster Gadakovsky. <laughs> Um, it's nice to be here, and it's my first time, second time in Canada overall, and uh, first time here in Calgary. Okay, my lectures are based on my games, because that's the stuff I know, I have analyzed it, and so, you know, feel free to ask me questions anytime, if you don't understand something. And today I'm going to cover my one of my favorite openings, which is uh, Dutch Leningrad. Um, okay, so... Uh, First I started playing this was actually during the Grand Prix, FIDE Grand Prix event in uh, 2000, uh, uh, 2000. So my question is, if black only had at five, I mean, isn't it to black's advantage to get the same structure, more or less, but except that white is not um, cramping black's position is only four, and it's a lot easier for, or there is more room for black to play, you know, compared to King's Indian. Because I used to play King's Indian a lot when I was younger. So I like this position because I thought, you know, okay, so I have one witness. But, you know, according to the classics, one witness is not enough to lose the game. You need to have two witnesses. And here you have a space for the pieces. You have pawns in the center, which are basically covering a lot of squares. And that doesn't give white uh, too much room to, uh, for maneuvering. And the only real witness is e6. But it's easily protected if the knight e8 goes, so black goes to e5. So okay, e5 is the main move, and now everybody plays b3. And um, again, white tries to put the bishop here on a3, the bishop on b2, he just wants to develop, put the rooks on the central piles, and start, you know, the pressure. Okay, but things are not so simple. So, knight a6, Sorry. just to see what he is just like, where he's strong, where he's weak, uh, try to pinpoint his openings, his weaknesses. And that struck me because, you know, even the girls know that they, they just do this incredible work. So, bishop g7. And we go to the same main position. Two, four, two, six, nine, two, three. And he plays again. B3. No, yeah, right. He plays B3. He often plays B5 immediately. And the idea behind B3 that you want to postpone any uh, cardinal changes in the center, in the pawn structure, before you develop them. So you develop first, because white has more space right now, right? Once he plays B5 and gives back his central pawn, there is no more space. But right now, white has space because black is on defensive. And um, I play A5 here. I try to play all those useful things in Indian moves. There is no discovery check. So a7, f3, and just what did I do? I know he plays rook e1 first. Okay, so he's still some tactics. And f3, he's trying to play for the my open king here. And then after, I mean, it's already a winning position. I'm just being sometimes extremely materialistic and I grab stuff. <laughs> just grab the pawn. I'm just trying to show him that his attack is a bit too large. So pawn g8, rook e4. I grab this pawn 
column two. Go page four. And guess what? I grabbed this phone too. <laughs> so sometimes it's necessary to show your opponent just to break break his resistance that you know all his dreams. And it's all based because suddenly he is the one who's under attack. Check. Queen is seven. His king is now vulnerable. I'm extra bishop up. Bishop and queen protects everything. And he's the one who's being made a zone. So he finally realized that he is lost and he resigns and he moves. So again, um, don't be scared if white goes for this whole attack thing. Because black has plenty of defensive resources. And um, again, do is uh, get the position that you feel comfortable with and uh, build your opening repertoire based on that. If you don't like cramped positions, play something open like, you know, Farish, or Dutch, even Grunkel, all these openings, <coughs> they give you space to, you know, to play with. If you're comfortable with the pawn chains, then close positions are for you. And uh, in this opening, I got both. I got a little space to work with. I have some weaknesses in the pawn structure, true, but it's very difficult to use. And I have um, in a lot of Dutch games in this line, the positions, they don't let you exchange too many pieces. I mean, the more pieces you exchange, the closer the game to the draw. And when you have this tension in the game, you have a lot of possibilities for chess, for pure chess, no theory. Any theory. I mean, like, you have to study his theory, of course. I mean, but look at those Sicilian knighters, for example. It's just crazy. You, know, you have to memorize all these lines. And there, every little move, every tactical move counts. And I don't like that. I like, I like, I like my chess strategic. That, that, that's why I play the stuff. Uh, what about the anti-Dutch? What? The anti-Dutch. Anti-Dutch? Play knight c3. Yeah, yeah, I hate the pawn, um, but okay. Getting, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not getting, getting my bishop on g7. That's no, why. <laughs> but are you getting covered on yeah, the no, playing like knight c3? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, working it, I'm working on it. I'm yeah. working on this knight c3. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, because really, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. Aronian actually came up with, uh, with this line against me. He plays knight f3, knight f6, c4, <laughs> g6, knight g3, g6. And he actually plays bishop f4 here yeah. against me. And it's like London, same thing. It's like he plays London against me. So it's like really interesting. And uh, I managed somehow to touch London system. And I hope guys you enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So anybody who has questions related to chess, uh, anything, feel free to ask. We have Q There's one. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Gata, when you're playing the. Um, the London system, yeah. and you play 1d4, is there any particular move by black that you really hate to see? That is, what's the worst black defense you can well, play the London against? That's what they play nowadays against me. Uh, that this is crazy setup with the, um, okay, so knight of six, bishop f4, e5, e3, e6, knight e2. Uh, I showed it, a uh, very interesting thing, I showed it to my teammates because in, I believe that when you play in a team, you should, you should like, like div divulge your uh, you know, preparations so you can help your teammates to win something. So that's so American it. teammates, so right? I no, not just American, but I showed my teammates because I play in the league in Russia, like okay. several years now. And I showed them that um, this line is uh, probably more important. All my best uh, <laughs> ideas, and they will know my vulnerabilities. Yeah. They can use it against me. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. Okay. Okay.